Dr. Benjamin Bickman, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Hey, Ben, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm delighted. Yeah, I'm really excited to chat with you and share you with my audience. I've been following your work for several years now. You're brilliant. The work you do is incredible. And I'd love to, for you to share what you're doing nowadays, but also let's get back into how you got into this space. Like what triggered you growing up to want to be in the health space? Yeah, well, let's not go too far back. Um, uh, but let's, uh, I've always been interested in health, um, partly because of my upbringing. We were all involved in, in athletics and sports to various degrees. Uh, me and certainly all my brothers and to a lesser degree, my sisters, they just never really got as interested. But uh, it, uh, when I got to school, I really, when I came to university, uh, I really was just thinking, what on earth am I going to do with my life? It was, it was a decision I felt really actually unprepared for. I had always sort of focused on other life goals that in a way are like marriage and family that are a little more kind of binary. You know, you meet a girl, you marry her, or you don't marry her, you know, and, and it's not like I could just pick any girl I wanted, like I could pick any, any degree or major that I wanted. So, uh, it was really a, a very deliberate matter for me, and I ended up just realizing that I'm fascinated by the body. And at the time, I was particularly fascinated by the adaptations that the body makes to exercise. So in particular, how does a muscle work better? How does the heart pump more efficiently? How do the lungs adapt to exchange gas better? So it was all within the realm of physiology, and, and that was my first... My undergraduate was exercise physiology. My, my master's degree was exercise physiology. And that was the point of, of deviation or departure from exercise. It was during my master's degree that I came across a paper published in the, in the mid-90s. And now I'm talking about kind of early 2000s at the time for me. But I found this paper revealing that fat cells secrete hormones. That to me was just incredible. You know, I just finished uh, an endocrinology course or I was taking an endocrinology course as a graduate student and, and I just loved it. And, the, and so I'm studying these, you know, prototypical or classical um, endocrine organs like the thyroid gland or the adrenal glands. And then to learn that the fat tissue itself is an endocrine organ. At the time, we didn't really appreciate the scope like we do now. I mean, there are dozens of hormones that come from the fat tissue alone. But at the time, there was one hormone, if we want to call it a hormone, a protein called TNF-alpha, an inflammatory protein that we knew was secreted from fat cells. That then, like I'd mentioned, was the point of departure for me where my graduate thesis looked at uh, an aspect of inflammation in older people. And then rather than start wanting to continue to study exercise, I wanted to study obesity. And then I, I did a PhD in, in a degree area called bioenergetics at a wonderful school, East Carolina, with an incredible mentor named Linus Dome. And that was looking at the muscle changes in obese individuals following gastric bypass. And then I wanted to do a little more. That really started to plant the seed of interest in one other particular hormone called insulin. And then I did my postdoctoral work with Duke Medical School in Singapore, of all places, with a great scientist named Scott Summers looking at the connection between lipids or fats and insulin resistance. And then uh, that's gotten me to where I am. When I got my own lab here at BYU, coming back to where I did my undergraduate, uh, remarkably, um, I knew I wanted to continue to focus on insulin. And that's what we continue to do. And we got a lot of neat projects going on, just about to publish a paper looking at how diesel exhaust particles that we inhale all the time are altering mitochondrial function and driving insulin resistance. But nevertheless, a lot of ongoing projects involving insulin, ketones, air pollution, um, uh, specific androgen receptor modulators or SARMs. We have anyway, all kinds of cool stuff going on right now. But because, you know, I get paid to be curious, so I may as well be really curious. <laughs> That's awesome. Getting paid to be curious. I love that. It doesn't pay very well for the record, <laughs> but it's still a cool job. Yeah, you love doing it. Right? I can see you're lit yeah. up just talking about it. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. So when you see somebody, and I see this all the time living in a, in a big city in Miami, somebody who's taking a jogging in the street with all these cars driving past them, I'm thinking, 
you know, it's not good to inhale all those oh, no. exhaust. Like what is happening to that person who's breathing in all those chemicals from the car? Yeah. So, so we've long known about this connection between air pollution and diabetes in particular. It, the, the correlational evidence, which we take with a grain of salt, is, is so strong um, to warrant further scrutiny. Uh, it, what we've found in, our, in the models that we're using, cells and rodent models in particular, you can take the, the smallest of the particles from diesel exhaust, the ones indeed that we can not only do we inhale, but they're small enough to actually move through the alveolar, uh, alveolar membrane and get from the lung and into the blood. These are teeny, teeny molecules. So we're studying those molecules and we find that in just one week of, of in our rodent model of, of the rodents inhaling this, and not even all the time, it's just infrequent little bursts like someone going out and running along a, a very busy street, for example, they get their insulin resistance. The score we're using is the homeostatic model assessment, the HOMA IR score, which is pretty commonly used. It goes from, uh, it, it, it more than doubles. Uh, it goes from a, a, tip, a, a nice range of, I think around one or so in the rodents, and then it goes up to over two. Um, so within one week, and then it just climbs up a little higher over the following weeks, but within just one week, their insulin resistance is essentially doubled. I mean, everyone has some degree of insulin resistance, if you will, I guess you could say, and it gets twice as bad within just one week of this infrequent exposure every day, like someone going out and running along a busy road. Wow. So that's insane. Uh, over- yeah, it's, it's pretty sobering, frankly. It also puts in... Um, it puts in perspective this appreciation of these very heavily industrialized or industrializing countries like India and China. They are right at the top of, of countries that are there. I mean, they're racing towards the top of the countries with the most diabetics. You wouldn't think it. India has more diabetics than any other country. And I can't help but wonder, might a part of that be this just profound air pollution that you see in India and China in particular? So what I'm thinking now is, because I know some, te- some toxins mimic the structure of hormones and they sit on the receptor sites of the cell yeah. membrane, and then all of a sudden you can't get the glucose in, so insulin is, is that something that you think is happening here? Yeah, no, excellent question, Ben. No, uh, this, would be, this would be a distinct mechanism. What you're, what you're referring to are these kind of estrogen mimetics, you know, things like you get in, in plasticizers or detergents, and, and those are also ubiquitous, mind you. They can seek through the skin. You can inhale them as well. You certainly can drink them and ingest them. Um, This molecule, these small diesel particles appear to bind inflammatory receptors on the surface of the cell membrane. There are these certain family of receptors called pattern recognition receptors, and they just recognize molecules of various structures. They're they're not really specific to any one thing. They just kind of recognize a a, a family or, or a who knows how a myriad myriad different molecules so the the diesel exhaust particle from what we can gather binds to this receptor on the surface of the cell it then in the cell turns on a pro-inflammatory process Uh, a consequence of that in addition to any of the consequences from the inflammation itself when you turn those pathways or processes on you begin to turn on well indeed you do turn on uh, the, the biosynthesis of a molecule called ceramide and then ceramide is created from um, just bystander fats, like the, the saturated fat palmitate, the most common saturated fat circulating in, in humans. It will take a palmitate and then mix it with a different small little uh, molecule and turn it into ceramide. And then ceramide directly starts to antagonize or to stop the insulin signal. Anyway, I don't think that's too technical, but it's I'm certainly not for you, but for the listeners um, that aren't biochemists, Suffice it to say, it's not by mimicking a hormone, um, it's by turning on inflammation. Yeah, that's super fascinating. So when does that paper come out? Yeah, I don't know yet. Hopefully, we'll submit it within the next couple of weeks. And at that point, once it's submitted, it's always a crapshoot. It just depends on the reviewers. You know, it could get right in or it could languish and peer review hell for six months. Well, if, any, if anything, it, it just brings uh, attention to anybody listening to this right now who's not aware of the fact that they're running outside with all these exhaust pipes, uh, all these cars driving by them. Find a better route if you can. Uh, definitely, it's, it's great to limit your exposure to that. Yeah, and so, they could even, I mean, if they were determined or just had no choice, get a PM2.5 mask filter. Um, uh, mind you, you're going to not only block out the PM2.5, but you also may start to do 
I mean, it, it kind of starts to mimic insofar as you might have a bit of a limitation on air exchange across the filter. It's sort of like you're doing the um, a train high sort of mentality where you're inducing some slight degree of, of oxygen deprivation. Uh, but I can't, I don't know the degree to which that happens, but, but if someone has no choice, their run is, is, even if it's indoors, depending on the quality of the air filter, if they're living in a heavily polluted area, like what we get here in Utah Valley in the winters, there's no avoiding it. And if I were someone who was engaging in frequent um, prolonged cardiovascular uh, aerobic exercise, I would absolutely invest in a, a PM 2.5 mask and they can get those on Amazon easily. Have you done any research on the most, the heavily, most heavily populated cities in the, in the U S no, I've not done anything on that. Okay. I would imagine that it's usually the, the larger cities if I had to guess. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know where Miami falls into that cause we do get the ocean breeze and it's very mm -hmm. windy here, but I if bet you're, you're better. Yeah, I, w I would guess. So, Insulin is your, your main focus. And why is it that, why is insulin your main focus when you could have jumped from area to area, but you stuck with insulin and that you're, you're known for being uh, really, well, really well versed in insulin. So what made you stick with insulin? Yeah, well, frankly, Ben, I hope I am. I hope um, whatever, I, whatever I may talk about in different venues, I hope that I always convey this um, foundation on, on a familiarity with insulin. I stuck with insulin, or maybe it's even better to say I focused on it because the more I learned, and that continues to this day, the more I learned about um, obesity and, and similar cardiometabolic dis disorders, the more the finger kept pointing at insulin. From whatever direction we were looking at, um, whatever topic I was teaching uh, most specifically, it was actually uh, almost nine years ago when I became a full-time professor and I had this teach an undergraduate class about disease, um, it wasn't really until then that I even appreciated just how relevant insulin was. I had long been looking at insulin really only in the context of obesity and diabetes. And, and it was once I started teaching this course about, well, the, the class is pathophysiology. So the sick, uh, when, when the physiological processes basically aren't working well, uh, the more I realized that insulin, hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance was a part of almost every chronic disease we were talking about. It really didn't matter. If we were talking about atherogenesis, yep, insulin played a part. If we were talking about fatty liver disease, the most common liver disorder, insulin played a part. The most common female infertility, uh, PCOS, yep, insulin played a part. part. The most common dementia, Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's disease, yep, insulin played a part. So and in fact, in Parkinson's too. So it, the more I would kind of go through the syllabus, the more I realized, boy, I've, I've sort of inadvertently created an insulin resistance class. Um, and it was never really my intention, but the fact that I could go through any disease tissue, you know, we could talk about liver pathophysiology and the way I've structured my classes now, we'll go through this sort of conventional um, topics there, scrutinizing the health of, say, the liver, just for example. And then I'll focus at the end, I'll devote a little bit of time to saying, ah, and here's how insulin resistance is relevant. And we'll go through atherosclerosis or heart disease, cardiomyopathies, and I'll say, and here's how insulin resistance is relevant. So I find that overwhelmingly, whatever the topic is, I can always kind of put that little uh, snippet at the end of the lecture, you know, take 10 or 15 minutes. And the reason I do that is it is so important to me that these students that are all, all of my students are future uh, medical professionals. They're all nursing, pre-med, pre-physician uh, assistant, physical therapy, all of them. And I think I, I find tremendous gratification knowing my students will wonder the degree to which insulin resistance is involved in whatever disease they're looking at. And if they can appreciate that insulin resistance plays a part, then they can appreciate that lifestyle is tremendously effective. So rather than just look at a drug as the very first option, scrutinize lifestyle and then send them out of your office. Give them a month to try a lifestyle change. And when you see them again, if that hasn't worked all right, we'll then have a different conversation. You know, you could, you could actually put me in that category of your students because I talk a lot about insulin. I've learned a lot from you. So whatever I teach, it's, it's really a credit ah, to you. Well, thank you. That's nice of you to say. Good, good. Uh, as for me, being a scientist where we operate in our small little 
worlds. You know, they're so insular. They really are. We say that almost like it's a, it's a cliche. We say it so often with regards to science. And, and it's true. At, at the most, a scientist uh, in, in, a, in, a, you, in a conventional setting, the most we can hope for is that we get a paper published and really no one will ever read it. I mean, my own, my own dad doesn't really care about my papers that are published, you know, as proud as he is of his uh, son, one of his many sons, uh, he, he still won't, he doesn't know what I'm publishing. No one does. It, it's, it's just sort of lining the, the waste paper baskets. But to, to know something, to learn something, like I'm very blessed to do, and then to be able to convey that to someone who can then make it really relevant, like what you're doing with Keto Camp or when I'm talking to a group of physicians, which is my favorite audience, um, it, it is really gratifying to imagine, or my students to think that there could be someone on the front lines who can take something I've learned because I'm curious, and now they can put it into practice. They can do something real with it. That, that's my greatest hope. Yeah, I love that. And you, that's exactly what's happening right now. So, you know, when, when my father, I don't know if you know this, but my father, he, he ended up passing away about six years ago from the complications of diabetes. He suffered a massive stroke and, and it took his life. Uh, about six years ago, I didn't really understand insulin and, and everything that I'm teaching the, to the degree that I understand it today. And they would give my, the doctors, conventional doctors would prescribe my father insulin and tell him to lose weight at the same time. And I didn't really understand how that could how there's a mismatch there but i didn't get yep. it uh and any he, he ended up losing his life and i started researching i started getting into your work dr fung's work which he was on the on the podcast a few episodes ago and i realized that there's a huge mismatch there because they're looking at glucose yep and that's their their main focus when the cause is what you just said it's insulin all roads lead to insulin and on this day september uh, what is it september 10th 2019 if you, if you go to the American Diabetes Association website, it's still backwards, in my opinion. Yeah. So why is it taught this way to this day? Yeah, I, I, I believe that there is um, a, a physiological and a historical precedent for the ongoing focus on glucose. Now, I don't believe it's excusable anymore, given the wealth of data that we have refuting these this precedent, but uh, I think it's because historically the most common manifestation of even type 2 diabetes, which is not at all like type 1, but what they have in common is that the person will, well, diabetes itself means essentially polyuria. The person is urinating a lot. And that excessive production of urine is a result directly of the high level of glucose. Essentially, the person's glucose is so high above the mid 200s, um, you know, 250 or so milligrams per deciliter in, in U.S. units, um, that the, the kidney cannot reabsorb all that glucose. And so the extra glucose starts spilling into the urine, and that creates a pull to pull water from the blood. And now the person is urinating a lot. So that most common, you know, from the time of ancient Egypt and, and, and even earlier, of course, till now, that very common feature of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes um, the polyuria is a consequence of the hyperglycemia. So that's somewhat um, forgivable when you look at it in that context. Now, when we fast forward to today, <clears throat> we know that insulin starts to change in the type 2 diabetic years, decades before the glucose starts to change. And of course, this is what you were alluding to a moment ago. If uh, Because of that, by focusing, by continuing to focus on the glucose, we're just looking at a symptom. It's not the root cause of the problem in the type 2 diabetic, or even in the type 1. If we were looking at insulin, uh, you know, we would start to detect the reductions in insulin, even in the type 1 diabetic, although that is admittedly much trickier. But certainly in the case of the type 2 diabetic, which is over 90% of all cases of diabetes, we see that over the years, the insulin is what's climbing. And as the person is becoming progressively insulin resistant, which indeed is happening in parallel with the increase in insulin, it's still enough to keep the glucose in check. And then eventually, the person will become so resistant to insulin that they simply have reached a ceiling. They cannot produce any more insulin than they're producing. And that's when we say that insulin has become deficient. Well, deficient is a relative term. It's not enough to keep the glucose in check anymore as now the glucose has started to climb, but it's still higher than it should have been. It's still higher than the average non-diabetic. So we say it's deficient, and yet it could be several times higher than the person without type 2 diabetes. So it's very, it's, it's very uh, tricky language, and I'm not suggesting it's deliberate, 
But I will say by continuing to focus on glucose, it is a wonderful way to sell a lot of insulin. It is. So if so many problems are a result, a cause of excessive insulin and insulin resistant, what would be the best dietary approach yeah. for that? Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're pitching me some slow balls, which I appreciate, of course, because <laughs> I know you know this as well as anyone. Yeah. So if we are scrutinizing glucose, if we're saying you are having a hard time controlling your glucose, there is an incredibly rational strategy. But before I mention it, which everyone knows I'm going to, everyone knows what I'm going to say anyway, I'll say that it, it is, it is remarkable to me just how willfully ignorant some people choose to be when they balk at, at, at scrutinizing carbohydrate um, as a function of the diet. But we give diabetics um, SGLT2 inhibitors. These are drugs that will push the glucose from the blood. We give them, I think it's alpha glucosidase inhibitors, um, basically inhibiting the ability of the guts to digest starch. So we're pushing the glucose out of the blood. We're blocking the glucose from coming into the blood, keeping it in the gut, mind you, giving them horrific diarrhea at the same time. And yet somewhere in the middle of this is just this question waiting to be asked. If we're trying to push it out, if we're trying to block it from coming in, why not just eat less? It is, after all, the one macronutrient that humans have zero biological need for. And that's not even controversial. The most dogmatic dietitian would have to, albeit reluctantly, admit carbohydrates are not essential. Now, I'm not saying don't eat any. I'm not saying that, as, as, as that despite that growing in, in popularity. Uh, I'm not saying don't eat any, but I'm saying why have your diet focused on the one macronutrient that you don't actually need and your body's also having a hard time metabolizing because it's accumulating in the blood. You can't get it out of the blood like you used to. So just eat less of it. Focus on the two macronutrients that aren't going to do that, aren't going to force this battle with glucose and moreover, aren't going to elicit a substantial bump in your insulin. So focus on the other two macros, scrutinize that one. To me, it is such a rational strategy. Now, I will say that when I've given talks to physicians, I am constantly delighted at how many nodding heads I see. When you really start to present this in, in this sort of hyper-rational um, strategy, they really, they really lock onto it. And, and I think it's a really a testament to their humility to say, I just never, I never learned it. And physicians don't get paid. I don't mean this to sound derogatory. Um, they don't get paid to be curious, to ask questions. A physician gets paid to see patients. That is the mechanism for compensation. I don't have that mechanism. I get paid to, I don't teach on, on Tuesdays. So here I am in my office. I don't teach the whole day. I, can, I could literally just sit here and ask myself questions, start scanning through all my textbooks, going through PubMed, finding Google Scholar, finding articles, and ultimately finding answers to my questions. So my point, lest, I, lest it seem like I'm getting distracted, when a physician hears this and sees the evidence, which I always show, of course, they, they see the truth of it overwhelmingly. Now, you might get some that still want to continue to resist, but overwhelmingly, they can at least sit back and say, okay, if I have a type 2 diabetic, I don't want to give them insulin. I will never forget a, a, a meeting I gave, uh, a talk I gave to a small um, cl a clinic here in, uh, in, in Provo, and uh, they, at the end of it, one of the physician assistants had tears in his eyes. And he came up to me after and he said, Ben, are you telling me that the type 2 diabetic I just saw before I came in here and I had him leave with a prescription for insulin, you're telling me that I'm killing him? And I said, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but yes. And I'm delighted to see the impact this has had on you because you're not going to think about it the same way you did before. Uh, it, I was very touched at how impacted he was by seeing the data, you know, the increased risk of cancer mortality, the increased heart disease uh, mortality when you're giving type 2 diabetics higher and higher levels of insulin, not to mention the incredible weight gain. Yeah, and that's kind of what happened with me when I, when I came across the research and figured out that uh, what they were doing was killing my dad just slower. Uh, yep. And, and, and I, I went from angry to wanting to learn more to educate more people. And, and that's where I think the most people should get to that point where they want to educate and learn and educate. And, and that's exactly what, why this podcast is in existence. I have a question. Speaking of being curious, I'm being very curious in this podcast because you're, you're a brilliant mind. Well, let's, let's, let's be honest. I'm not brilliant. I just have learned 
stuff through patience and time that other people now find interesting. That's really all it is. I, I, you know, so I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be too self-deprecating, but I do think there's some value here to anyone hearing this. Uh, when I talk to my little delightful, beautiful little nine-year-old girl, and she'll struggle with math or struggle with, you know, reading and spelling a big word. She'll say, Dad, I'm just not as smart as you. And I'll say, no, you darling little angel. You could be much smarter than me. I don't know what your actual intellect is. And now again, I, I see I'm getting a little off topic. But it really is just a matter of someone taking the time. I would never want someone to say, oh, I can't really know the things that Ben Bickman knows because I'm not as smart as him. No way. B.S. It is just I've taken the time. That's all I've been doing for the last almost 20 years. So I, I, I sure as hell better know a lot about it. You know? <laughs> yeah, great distinction. You're absolutely right. So when it comes to foods that stimulate insulin, we know carbohydrates do that. But let's say we're talking about somebody who is not insulin resistant. They're pretty, they're pretty healthy. Somebody, let's say a 25-year-old male who does not have any insulin resistance. And for that person, at a cellular level, would their cells run better off of burning sugar glucose as their primary fuel source or fat as their primary fuel source? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, Ben. Um, I don't know. In, in the case, I, I, can't, I can't think of a study off the top of my head that allows me to answer that question with too much um, specificity. So I'll speculate somewhat. We know in that individual, they are metabolically flexible. So in the fed state, they utilize carbohydrate very well. Um, insulin has come up and down within a, you know, kind of two to three hour range, um, maybe four hours, uh, never gets too high, you know, maybe five times higher than, than resting state. Um, they, they, they use the glucose that comes into the blood because uh, that, when you eat glucose, that takes um, that goes right to the front of the queue. Uh, you know, if, if you think about all the stored energy and the consumed energy, in a way, you can think of it as this, well, a queue, like a line of, of, of the, the, these energy sources lined up to be used. You know, they're, they're kind of stepping into the furnace, if you will. Um, that's a disturbing um, analogy, but they're, they're, boarding, they're boarding the metabolic bus uh, you know, to be it. oxidized. Um, when you eat carbohydrate, that goes right to the front of the queue. Uh, there is a limited capacity of carbohydrate in the blood. It must stay within a narrow range or you get this polyuria, the, the, the diabetes-induced um, polyuria or urination that I mentioned earlier, which if it goes long enough can result in a, in a non-ketotic coma where you've urinated so much that your blood pressure is too low and you can't perfuse the blood to the brain and you die. So it really is a matter of life or death to keep that blood glucose in a narrow range. So the healthy person eats it, they metabolize that glucose very well, they push it out. By that, I mean, they get it out of the blood into the cells, particularly muscle cells. But that, of course, many, many others, fat cells and neurons and everywhere else. But they do that very well. Um, in contrast, so that is all my whole too long um, of an explanation is the fed state. In the fasted state, they switch to using fat for fuel. And you can detect this very well by measuring um, the respiratory exchange ratio just by uh, um, trapping or, or tracking someone's um, gas exchange, CO2 out and O2 in, and the degree to which O2 also comes back out. Um, in, in a person who's um, you know, insulin resistant on that spectrum, and, and everyone's on the spectrum somewhere, people who are further along it, they are more metabolically inflexible it's like they're constantly locked in the fed state. They're trying to burn glucose all the time. Now, the fact that the glucose is starting to accumulate in the blood means that even though they're locked in this sugar burning mode, they're still not doing it particularly well. But when they go to a fasted state, they actually don't really make that shift. You should see this dramatic shift in, in the, 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 the energy source shifting from sugar burning to fat burning, and yet they stay locked in sugar burning mode. This is particularly unfortunate, and I love to use this um, analogy of a big fuel tanker. Imagine a big fuel tanker, a big semi-truck um, with that big tank of fuel hooked onto its back. And when you look at the truck, you could see with a little bit of um, discernment that there are in fact two fuel sources. There's the massive fuel tank that you can't help but see. Then there's that small little tank tucked underneath the cab of the big rig of the semi-truck. That is that truck's fuel source. It is tapped to only use that fuel source. And yet, and so every three or four hours as that fuel tank starts to run dry, they got to stop and fill it up. They got to stop and fill it up. But tragically, right, the great irony is that while it's 
uh, it, it is dependent on how much fuel it can get from that small little tank. It's carrying around that massive tank of fuel. Well, the comparison, of course, the parallel on the human body is that we have a finite amount of stored glucose, you know, a little bit in the blood and then more in the liver and in the muscles. That is the tank that most people are only ever tapping. They're only ever tapping that carbohydrate tank, the sugar tank. And so, of course, as we have a finite capacity for carbohydrate storage, you know, around 2,000 calories, they got to stop and top that up all the time. But if we can allow this metabolic shift to now finally, you know, replumb um, the, the engine so that the fuel line can connect to both the carbohydrate tank and the big fat tank, imagine tapping into that fat. It creates an entirely different paradigm. Um, and, you know, when, when I hear about people here in Utah hiking the beautiful mountains, oh, I need all these energy bars. I need nuts. I need energy. No, you don't. You have energy bars strapped all over your body. It's just called fat tissue. And you never are able to just stop and open up those energy bars and use that energy because your insulin isn't letting you. That's kind of a point I'm not getting to very well. Insulin is what controls which tank the truck uh, metabolically is using. If we're burning sugar, it's because insulin is high. If, ins if we allow insulin to come low, and for some people that might be a matter of time, you and I, we're healthy, fit guys, our insulin can come down in you know, six hours uh, to, to just absolute baseline. In someone who's insulin resistant, it could take them 48 hours of fasting before it really gets down low enough to have this pronounced shift in fuel use. So allow the hybrid engine that is the metabolic human body, um, human metabolism, allow it to in fact be a hybrid, shift fuels as needed. Uh, you know, carbohydrate when we're fed, especially in the conventional diet when it's carb heavy, and then fat when we're not fed. That is the key to metabolic health. Yeah, and that's what it's about. Like you said, metabolic flexibility is key. It's not necessarily just being uh, eat keto all the time or low carb all yeah. the time. It's about having the ability to go back and forth without a hiccup. Yeah, so that's if, right. So if somebody is um, eating every two to three hours and they decided that they heard about the wonderful benefits of intermittent fasting and they're going to fast today, but they don't have that metabolic flexibility. So now it's five hours in and they've depleted or they're really low in their glycogen stores and they don't have the capability to shift and start tapping into their fat stores, that big fuel tank. What happens to the body at that point? Yeah, well, they're going to sense <clears throat> potentially, depending on the person, they can sense this slight little dip in glucose levels. So let's say if they're somewhat insulin resistant, they're probably, their fasting glucose levels are likely going to be high 80s, 90s, maybe even low 100s. That's not diabetic, mind you, so that would theoretically not be a problem, at least clinically speaking. But as the blood glucose levels may start to go to the low 80s and even 70s, they will feel this sense of anxiety and, and may panic and certainly hunger. But hunger um, comes in different stages. I commonly talk about it in two stages, but I'm not a hunger guy. So I'd want anyone knowing, listening to know that I'm, I, I'm, this is sort of Ben's, you know, the gospel according to Ben um, uh, here. So it's my epistle with regards to hunger. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not John or, you know, any of the New Testament prophets or, or apostles, but this is the gospel according to Ben when it comes to fasting. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's what is in your guts, what is in your intestines. That is the first phase of hunger, usually 24 hour. Well, in fact, maybe the first sensation would be you have this slight bump in low glucose levels relative to what you're used to. That is that first phase, you know, maybe six hours. Then it is the gut phase, which is I had something in my intestines and now I don't, it's moved through and I sense that vacuum. I sense that empty gut and it makes me uncomfortable in my guts. And then third, and those two pass, those two will usually pass 24 to 48 hours. Now, mind you, I'm, I don't intend to sound like I'm a big advocate of five-day fast or anything. Those are something which can be very beneficial, no doubt, and, and Jason Fung knows that better than anybody, and I have tremendous respect for what he's doing, he and Megan. But I, I'd say when someone's just doing a five-day fast, they do need to be somewhat deliberate. But those two first phases of hunger, the small lowering of glucose with um, six hours or so, and then the emptying of the intestines 24 hours or so, once someone has passed that, then it's a matter of, do you have enough fat? You know, and stories of people fasting, not stories, actual clinical studies, fasting for a whole year because they are just so fat that all they need is to make sure they're getting vitamins, minerals, electrolytes, and water, and they have enough fat. They have enough energy stored as fat. And then true, so they're not starving, they're fasting. 
The difference between, I'm sorry, I'm, I am getting on a tangent, but I'm not going to let you stop me now. <laughs> the difference between um, fasting and starving is fat mass. That is the buffer. The moment the person has started running out of fat tissue, now they don't have enough um, lipid to create ketones. Then the body will start cutting muscle. That is the border between fasting and starvation. It is all about, can I still make ketones? Yep, I can, I can, I can. Now I'm out of fat. I cannot make enough ketones anymore to feed the brain. I've got to switch entirely to essentially to glucose. And that means I got to start stripping all the amino acids from the muscle for gluconeogenesis. And now I, the liver can pick up the slack and start feeding the brain. That is the point of starvation. But of course, in our society, people will never really get to that point. They, you know, you and I are both two lean guys. We got enough fat to, we could fast for you know, weeks, frankly. Yeah, I think Dr. Dr. Fung wrote in his book, The Complete Guide to Fasting, that it's about 5% body fat that you get to that point where you yeah. start uh, breaking down pr protein. And, and gluconeogenesis, I want to get into that because people hear that word and they think, oh, that's, it's a bad thing, but it's actually a survival mechanism and it's actually, it could be a great thing for you. And, and when it comes to the keto diet, a lot of people fear excessive protein. So I, I want to get clear on something personally because I'm not clear on this. I've studied a little bit of a uh, Nora Ged Gaudis. And Nora Ged Gaudis said in one of her books, I forget, I think it was Primal Fat Burner, excessive protein. And I don't know if this person was already keto adapted or not, but excessive protein, 36 to 58% of it could be converted to glucose. And uh, I think I heard you speak on a podcast something differently. So I'd love to get clear on, on this process. Of well, excessive food yeah, food yeah. Protein. Well, yeah. So it, it is a good question. And the whole reason I spoke about it a couple years ago in Denver was because um, that was still near the beginning of my steps into the whole low carb community. I had long been, of course, an insulin scientist, but those were the first, it was really 2016 that I, I think I gave my very first talk at low carb Denver, low carb Breckenridge at the time. You did a great job, by the way. Well, thank you. Thank, I was delighted to go. Honestly, the reception has been so delightful that I have zero regrets. Um, but it was that within the span of that one year of me kind of stepping into the space, I was struck by how many people were focusing on drinking oil. Like literally, a lot of their diet was drinking oil. And I thought, that is bizarre. And, you know, scratching beneath the surface a little bit revealed that the, the, their rationale was a fear of protein because of gluconeogenesis. And it's going to kick me out of ketosis. And I just thought, this is the wrong way of looking at how to eat healthily. And... It was some. It was me then going back and appreciating the work of scientists of the past, particularly UT Southwestern. It was work of George Cahill, who's passed on. It was work of Roger Unger in particular. But looking at the changes in insulin and then glucagon, it was me kind of introducing this, un, uh, you know, un, uh, here, hitherto at the time unmentioned um, player in all of this glucagon, and it was finding that. If glucose levels were, were normal, uh, then the, whatever the subtle change in insulin was with the ingestion of protein, there was a comparable increase in glucagon. So the two were moving together. And insofar as glucagon is an antagonist to insulin, what insulin was trying to do, glucagon was essentially offsetting. And so the insulin to glucagon ratio, which I believe defines a fed or a fasted state essentially, um, and we could get into more of that later, but it's essentially stayed the same as it was during the fasted state. It was modestly in elevated, but, but not substantially. In contrast, if glucose goes up or if someone has an underlying hyperglycemia or they eat protein with glucose, which mind you in nature rarely happens, it uh, really other than, than dairy, you don't really get a source of both protein and substantial carb. Um, I, I I believe dairy is the only source, although someone could convince me otherwise. Um, in that case, if it's protein and carbohydrate together, well, that was a different, that's a different story. Uh, you really do um, amplify the glycemic response by adding protein onto the carbohydrate. But again, in nature, that doesn't really happen, except dairy, and I think that's quite rational. The only time humans um, really drink milk or they're you know, evolutionarily intended to is when they're growing they're at their most substantial rate as, as newborns and children. Um, I think that's sort of a, a brilliant part of the design of, of human evolution. So nevertheless, uh, protein, I believed, and I still do, uh, was, was being unnecessarily scrutinized. And indeed, I, I think it was harmful the degree to which people were, were being wary of it. And 
and, and, and with a little bit of um, research and looking into the insulin to glucagon ratio, I became utterly convinced and then wanted to pass on some of that conviction um, with that talk, looking at the insulin to glucagon ratio. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm going to put the link for that talk in the notes if you guys want to check it out. I highly recommend it. So when it comes to fasting, let's talk a little bit about that. I know you're a big fan, or you used to be, I don't know if you still are, of a, a training in the fasted state. You, used yeah. to, you wake up early in the morning before your kids are up. What are your, what are your thoughts on a fasted workout? Yeah, so I am an advocate of a fast, uh, exercising in a fasted state, but I wouldn't want someone to take that as gospel because I know some people who just feel somewhat nauseous if they don't have something in their guts. And in contrast, I don't feel good if I do. Uh, so I can very much appreciate someone being on either side of this. I prefer to exercise in the fasted state for two reasons. Um, but again, this is just my own personal way of doing it as, as, a, as a kind of busy dad, husband, scientist. Um, I want to I wanna stay light and, and lean because all of my workouts are calisthenics. They're all body weight based. And I just don't want to have a pound or something in my gut. If I'm trying to do an L sit on the floor or if I'm, if I'm trying to do muscle ups on the bar, you know, I don't want to make it any harder than it already is as a, you know, middle-aged sleep deprived dad. Um, so that's the first one. I want to just have kind of a, a lean, mean uh, body weight based workout. And second, I want to have a, a greater heightened state of fat burning because if I haven't put glucose in my system um, or indeed anything, what you just eat goes to the front of that metabolic cue that I mentioned earlier. What you eat boards the bus before what you have stored. And because I want to be using what I have stored, I don't want something to bump in line in front of it, you know? So I want to exercise. I want that higher metabolic rate, that, that higher metabolic demand, the fuel demand. I want that to be tapping what's stored. I want that stuff to be getting on the metabolic bus, not the stuff I'm just putting in the butts in front. Yeah. And you, uh, I heard you say on a previous podcast, choose where you want your blood flow to go, right? You could yeah. have it go towards digesting food or have it go towards crushing some weights, crushing a workout and yep. burning some fat. So choose. Yeah. Where you good want for me. Blood. If I said that before, that sounds smart. That's a good you way did. to put it. You yeah. did say it before good. on a podcast. How many fat storage hormones do we have? Oh, so how many hormones promote the storage of fat? No. How many fat storage hormones do we have that are that are oh, oh how many hormones the, come from fat not how many hormones come from, from fat how many hormones cause us to store fat that are inter that are independent of insulin um you could make the case that cortisol has that ability um but i would i would challenge that somewhat but let's 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 say cortisol i i cannot think of another hormone um, that will promote the uptake and storage of energy other than insulin and cortisol. But even then, cortisol kind of hijacks insulin's pathway. It just actually results in a shifting of where we store the fat. So cortisol just tells the body essentially where to store fat. Insulin still is where the rubber meets the road. I am unaware of a hormone that can do what insulin can do by way of promoting um, uh, lipogenesis and, and, or just adipocyte growth. Me too. Me too. I just, I wanted to make sure I wanted to verify. Yeah. yeah but I will say the one, like, the one cool thing about cortisol or not cool, the, the unique, it sucks actually. The terrible <laughs> thing about cortisol is that it does result in a shift. And, and if you take someone who has um, Cushing's disease or Cushing syndrome, with that the chronically elevated cortisol level, what happens is you have this very selective shift where on the limbs from the legs and arms, you actually have heightened lipolysis. You're activating these enzymes, ATDL and hormone-sensitive lipase that actually promote the breakdown and movement of, of fat from, from the limbs, from the arms um, and, and, the, and, the, and the legs and, and button hips even. And you have, in contrast, an activation of the lipogenic enzymes, lipoprotein lipase in particular, all in the truncal space. And so you have this dramatic shift that happens over the course of a few months of pulling all the fat from the limbs, all the systemic fat storage and making it all, or peripheral fat storage and making it all be truncal. And I mean truncal. I mean, it's basically from the face to the groin and, and nowhere else. So if somebody has Cushing's disease, that's, that's their profile. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a horrific uh, disorder. And one of the most common causes of death is suicide. In people wow. That de this, so help with cortisol just wreaks such havoc on the body when cortisol, and the change in the change in fat is just 
one of the many aspects, frankly. When cortisol is activated, it also activates uh, an insulin spike, correct? Yeah, yeah. So it's an insulin antagonist. And so if, you, if muscle cells, for example, are exposed to cortisol, they make the muscle cell insulin resistant. Oddly enough, cortisol wants to increase blood glucose. It is, it is a glucocorticoid. It just wants to push glucose up higher and higher, presumably for justifiable reason, perhaps for fueling an immune response, for example, or for fueling uh, a flight or flight, a fight response, a sympathetic response. But, and you don't need insulin for that because if you're running, insulin's actually really low. The muscle's pulling in the glucose through an insulin independent contraction induced mechanism. So even then you don't need the insulin to move the glucose into the muscle cell like you normally would in a, in a resting state. Uh, that's kind of beside the point. But glucose wants, like cortisol wants to push up glucose. It is a glucocorticoid. Insulin, of course, wants to lower blood glucose. So cortisol will directly antagonize insulin by actually promoting the production of the molecule I mentioned earlier called ceramides. As the ceramides are accumulating in the adipocytes or the muscle cells, it makes them insulin resistant. That's fascinating. So we have about a little less than 10 minutes. I want to make sure I get to a, a few questions I have here. What do you think about the advice that a lot of uh, prof health professionals, P PhDs, dietitians, and personal trainers give on weight loss? Uh, count your calories, yeah. ex exercise more, eat less, and if you meet this deficit, you're going to lose weight. What do you think about that philosophy? Yeah, I think it is unfortunate. Um, I once heard Gary Tobbs say this, and then I totally, I immediately stole it from him. And then I've, I've started using the same um, example here. So I, every semester when I start teaching about um, obesity to my pathophysiology students, I present this scenario, which I'll briefly do here. Imagine I'm inviting everyone who's listening to my home for a buffet. And it's going to be the world's most famous chefs. And they're going to produce the most delicious food you can imagine. I want you to come as hungry as possible. What are you going to do to make sure you come as hungry as possible to my house? Generally, the consensus will um, simplify to two things. They're going to miss, skip some meals, and they're going to exercise really hard. And then I have the student just stop. And I, can you see the problem with that? I just ask you to tell me what should you do to become as hungry as possible. And you said you should eat less and exercise more. And what are the two things we always tell people to do to lose weight? Eat less and exercise more. It is the perfect recipe to promote as uh, hunger. And hunger will always win, especially in our environment of food being ever present. Hunger will win. And so don't, don't try to live in a caloric deficit. Rather, appreciate that human obesity is a matter of two uh, um, aspect, two pillars. One is indeed the thermodynamics. Energy must be accounted for. Now, I can still talk about that, of course, but it, we also have to acknowledge that we are complicated metabolic machines, and hormones are what tell the body what to do with the energy that it has. The energy that, so we, we, we eat, we consume energy, energy comes in, and then the philosophy is it must be matched by energy that's going out in the form of metabolic rate. Um, and that metabolic rate will include, of course, exercise. You know, we're exercising, we're burning another 100 calories. Um, so, so the idea is that you can just sort of do some simple accounting and account for everything. That is absolutely um, wrong. That's a wrong-headed approach. I am not attempting to refute the laws of thermodynamics, but I am stating the absolute conviction the human body doesn't operate in that nice, tidy um, realm of, of perfect thermodynamics. Uh, we have to account for energy output and input in all of its ways. The degree to which all of the energy is digested, the degree to which the energy ingested requires energy just to be digested and absorbed. And that's the thermic effect of food. Um, and then the degree to which there could be a change in energy output. For example, we know through several studies that if someone has low insulin levels, their metabolic rate can be a 10% higher than if insulin is high. And we know this in type 1 diabetics. You give a type 1 diabetic, put them from an insulin deficient state, and then give them a bolus of insulin, their, me their metabolic rate will drop by up to 300 calories. Immediately, you can detect it in real time. This is from work 100 years ago um, from uh, Benedict and Joslin. You could, these two of the most famous scientists, um, you can see this very real immediate drop in metabolic rate as insulin comes up. See that in type 2 diabetics as well. And, we, and, and David Ludwig at Harvard, um, for whom I have 
remarkable, uh, tremendous, tremendous respect. He found that uh, when you put people into a low carb versus high carb diet, the difference in metabolic rate is almost 300 calories per day. So wow. kind of going along the lines of that 10% change. So we have to account for the energy output and what I've talked about before, the very first talk I ever gave at Low Carb Breckenridge, I think 2016, and it was looking at energy wasting because that is what's happening when ketones are being pushed out of the body. When every time someone's blowing and sensing ketones, every time they're urinating on a ketone strip, that is energy that was neither, um, it was neither stored nor burned to account for metabolic rate. It was wasted. So it's this third avenue of energy output that is just not considered um, in enough and frequently enough. Remember, a ketone is a small piece of fat. We take the long carbon chain of fat and we start splitting it up into pieces. Those pieces can become ketones. So we have little pieces of fat that we're just pushing out of the body in the breath and in the, and in the urine that is neither burned for energy. It is not stored for energy as energy. It is just wasted from the body. So I believe the endocrine aspect of obesity encompasses or accounts for the thermodynamic or the caloric um, uh, explanation for obesity. So to me, that's a, a nice middle ground. We just have to acknowledge that hormones dictate how the body uses energy. Yeah, it's much more complicated than just simply calories in versus calories it out. It is. It is. That is a wrong way of looking at it. Yeah, it's just a distraction. It's a yeah, distraction. it is. And it's sad. It's sad because I do believe when people are saying that they have the best of intentions, little knowing that they're just setting their client up to fail. Yeah, and I've been there. I've done, it, I've done it for many years before I realized yeah, same. that. I was, uh, during my master's degree, I was a personal trainer, and I hated it because I'd worked these, with these wonderful middle-aged women, and they weren't losing a single pound. And, and I was just so frustrated, and I kept thinking, oh, you guys just aren't doing it. You're not doing it. Uh, it's how smug I was being a young, lean guy. I, how I wish, I'm sure, like what you're suggesting, how I wish I knew then what I do now. Exactly. Uh, two more questions before we wrap this up. What is, what are the, what's the most exciting thing that you're working on right now? Yeah. So, um, I'm going to put, um, I almost, I don't want, I'm almost reluctant to say this, but no one's going to listen to this who would be a rival in the same space. So I'll say this. We have just gotten approval to look at the degree to which pure macronutrient consumption, protein, carb, fat affects mTOR, um, activation because there's this whole fear of protein. You know, you don't want to eat too much protein, you'll activate mTOR and you're going to age faster. And I just say, I think that is the wrong way of looking at it. Um, we know insulin activates mTOR more than any amino acid does. You said two to three times more than protein. Yeah, yeah, right? that, yeah, that's right. In fact, that was a study done in muscle cells. So that's not even my study. This was done years ago, treating muscle cells with amino acid directly or insulin directly. And the insulin stimulated the mTOR significantly higher than the amino acid did. So we want to look at the whole body. If we have people just come in and consume 300 calories straight of the macronutrients, what happens to mTOR activation in the body? Um, that's probably the most um, exciting. That's, that's the human study we're doing, but we're doing all kinds of stuff. We have the diesel exhaust project, we have a Yerba Mate project, um, you know, that South American kind of. Yeah. You have it for pre-workout, don't you? Yeah, I do. I sure do. That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's a fun project. We have a project looking at the, effect on um, muscle uh, recruitment and recovery and mitochondrial function with these specific androgen receptor modulators. Any kind of lifters out there would know what SARMs are. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I had an easier way of getting them, frankly. So if anyone's listening to this and has contact who manufactures them, they're hard to get. There you go. Um, but uh, anyway, anyway uh, we, we also still have the whole ketone brown adipose mitochondrial and coupling story that we haven't yet published. Yeah. Everyone's heard me talk about that before. Hopefully that'll be submitted for publication by the end of the year. Yeah. I want to have you back on in the future and talk more about the brown fat. I think that's very fascinating. Well, hey, not to put a, too much of a shameless plug in here, believe it or not, I actually have a book coming out next July talking all about insulin resistance, basically why someone should care about it, all the diseases that are impacted by it and what to do about it. And so, yeah, you, you have me on again so I can do some shameless stuff. Yeah, I will. I will. I can't wait to read that book. Do you have a title yet? Yeah, it's Why We Get Sick. Um, and then it's basically the relevance of insulin resistance behind most chronic diseases. That's going to be a great book. I can't wait It'll to be read fun. That. Yeah, yeah, it'll be a good read. Hopefully educational. Yeah, I'll definitely have you back on. And the final question for you, Dr. Bickman, is what is your, your definition of perfect health? Oh, yeah. 
to the man with the hammer, everything's a nail. Insulin is the nail and I hit it as much as I can. So to me, optimal or perfect health, I hate to use the word perfect, but let's say you said it first. Perfect mm-hmm. health is living a life where the majority of time is spent where insulin is in a basal state. Beautiful. Dr. Bickman, I want to acknowledge you for the work that you continuously do and provide and you're curious and you bring it out to the world. And I've personally learned so much from you over the past few years. And I do consider myself a student of yours. And I really look up to you and the work that you're doing. And thank you for carving out some of the uh, part of your day to spend with us. I know that my audience got so much value from this. And just wanted to say I appreciate your work very much. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. If, if you've been a student, well, you've earned an A uh, several times over. So, so 4.0 for you. Good job. Ben, thanks for the invitation. It was a lot of fun to be able to discuss all these topics. I hope the listeners were able to get some gems out of this.